Hey everybody, uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. My name is Mike Rival. I'm one of the managing brokers for Realty Advantage in Rockville. Uh, we're really excited to have Bill Horan with us today. He's with Realty Exchange Corporation and an expert on 1031 exchanges. Uh, Andres, I see the baby. Congratulations. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, right now, I do have everybody muted just so we can get things kicked off, but I'll start opening that up. Um, so if anybody has any questions, uh, please feel free to either just ask the question or enter it into the, uh, the chat area. Uh, again, today we're going to uh, cover 1031s. And um, if you haven't done one of these yet, uh, it's a fantastic tool. Uh, I've done quite a few myself. And if you are working with investors or if you are doing any commercial property work, um, this is a tool of choice. So I'm really excited to have uh, Bill with us here. And um, with that said, Bill, I'm going to pass to you. I think you handed it off to me. So I, I got him. Yeah. There you go. All right. Um, so Aunt, Aunt Marilyn, Uncle, Uncle Sam, you know, I don't like to use the analogy partner, but they're your partner in when you sell profitable real estate and they're going to get a cut. And whether they did any of the work on it or not, that's a different animal, but that's the way our system works is they participate in your gains and so they're going to want a piece. Fundamentally, what an exchange is about is they'll agree to go along with you to the new property. So you can give up a property and then move it someplace else and keep going you're deferring the tax, they'll wait to get paid until you end up cashing out of the investment. And I'm gonna walk you through how that works and what that structure looks like. Um, here's what I'm gonna try and cover. Who am I? Who is Realty Exchange Corporation and why you should and uh, maybe not, should not listen to me. Uh, what is an exchange? Where does it come from? Just the uh, legal stuff. What is the definition of like kind? Because I see that all the time. What, what does like kind mean? What about the timing to do an exchange and an identification and what does that mean? Because the government doesn't let you give up property and then swing in the wind out there for years and not replace what you sold and not pay taxes. So you got to do this thing in a, in a window of time. How much do you have to buy to not pay tax? What is the role of the qualified intermediary? That's what my business is, is being the qualified intermediary, the middleman for exchanges. What is the process paperwork? I'm going to touch on reverse exchanges, how we do them backwards and I'll, I'll show you what, what I'm talking about here. And then some end games, some strategies, things that I see clients doing with exchanging. So I got a decent amount to cover here. My dad started the company in 1990. Actually, um, uh, June 6th this year, this month was our 30 years. So it's hard to believe this thing is 30 years old. This is all we do. There's seven of us over here in Gainesville, Virginia, helping clients do exchanges all over the country but most of our clients are here in the mid-Atlantic. Um, we do a decent amount at the beaches, Ocean City, Bethany, Outer Banks, because there's a lot of rentals at the beach. And then we get into lots of questions about whether it's a second home, is it an investment property, what is it? But we, we work through those sorts of things. Um, Dad wrote a book, it's up on Amazon. He has written a second book and we're working on getting it published and put it back up on Amazon. Um, we're members of FEA, which is our national association of QI companies like myself. Um, we run right along with NAR, you know, the big gorilla that you guys all belong to, and all the other associations, the builders, the real estate roundtable, the apartment guys, all that stuff. Um, I was part of a team that got law passed on qualified intermediaries like myself in Virginia. So Virginia has law on companies like myself. And I'm going to touch on that a little bit. And then we use a system called Always Safe, which is how we protect funds. So in this exchange process, the client's money goes to this stranger, this third party, and how do we protect that cash? And then I carry a designation called CES. So my industry has a designation, so many years in the business, code of ethics, uh, uh, continuing ed, all that sort of stuff. Just like you guys do have initials. I am not an attorney, I'm not a CPA, right? but I am a CES. Um, I always start with the, this slide, and I always put planning at the top of the slide. Um, these really need to be planned out. They come with a clock. You really need to know what you're doing and sell something and turn around and buy something new. You guys know the market is, inventory is low, so people can sell today. 
but with an exchange, they got to turn around and buy and they got to compete to buy and they got a clock ticking over their head or they got a big tax bill. So they better have this stuff planned out or they're going to mess it up. Okay. Uh, you'd be surprised how many of my clients are tired of the sales process. They go to closing and then they, I get the email while I'm going on vacation. I'm like, okay, well, the government doesn't care what your issues are. You only have a certain window of time to buy stuff and you better do it right? Or you're going to pay, which is fine. Government loves you. Pay your taxes. But you have a moment in time to not pay those taxes and reinvest and keep going. Um, but you got to plan it out. I'm, I'm reemphasizing that, recycling around. This is purely investment property. This is not about homes, primary residence, or second homes. Those are all personal use properties. They are not what we're talking about. You guys are right in the middle. You see everything right on the front line. You see when somebody's selling and when they're buying. You're right in the middle of the process. Got my normal legal community, contracts, settlements, all that good stuff. And I got the poor CPA. Uh, that should be the first phone call somebody makes. I'm selling my rental townhouse. What is my potential tax bill? Got to know your, I call it your pain number. How much pain are you going to be in when you write that check? And if it's a little number, just sell the property and get out. Cash out pay your taxes, be done. If it's a big number and you have thoughts about moving uh, the property someplace else, a better investment, different kind of investment, whatever, then do the exchange. But put the CPA in the loop early, right? Because they, they know what's going on on somebody's tax return and can make help make decisions on that stuff. But I, I wish they were at the top of the list, the first phone call, right, to decide whether they should do an exchange or not. All right. Uh, why do people do exchanges? What's the motivation? So taxes is a big deal. I did an exchange for a doctor down off of H Street. You guys know where H Street is in D.C. That, you know, it's going nuts down there. Um, uh, $2.1 million, little row house. And the builders were banging on his door. So it was a great deal for him. And uh, they set up for an exchange and they spent all the money. It was almost it was all cash. And they were left with about 93 of cash. And I was like, just take the money and pay your taxes on the 93. You did good. No, no, I'm not giving the government any money. And so he was adamant. He was not giving the government any money. So they went and bought two parking spaces and they ate up that $93,000. So he had planned it out. His daughter-in-law was an attorney helping him with the whole process. So they knew what they were doing, but from a business decision wise, whether two parking places was the right thing to do or not, I have no idea, but he was adamant not giving the government any cash. Um, motivation for doing exchanges, um, I have an orange one. I don't like orange anymore, I want a blue one. So I'm just gonna change it, I'm gonna move it someplace else. I'm sitting on dirt, I'm mowing grass, I'm paying property taxes, I'm not getting any cash. So now I'm going to go sell that dirt and buy myself a rental beach house and generate some cash flow. Change the type of property so that it fits better for what I need. Maybe it's maintenance. You know, yours is 100 years old. You got to put a new roof on it. You got to spend all this money on it. The heck with that. I'm just going to sell this thing as is, dump it, and then take the money and buy a nice shiny new property, right? No headaches. Hopefully no headaches. Brand new. Uh, maybe it's bad property, meaning... I bought into a neighborhood. It was a great rental neighborhood when I started, but the neighborhood's turned on me. And I'm not gonna make any more money here. I'm stagnant. Sell that thing, get out, and move it to where the grass is greener. And I, I know everybody knows where the grass is greener. Um, opportunity. So I see clients using this as an opportunity change, meaning I'm gonna sell a rental townhouse, right? Residential stuff, and then bridge into commercial. Maybe that's my new opportunity. I'm going to go sell my rental townhouse and I'm going to go buy myself a little Dollar General store or something like that. Whatever the new opportunity is, this is a mechanism to do that and not pay tax in that step. And also leverage. So I'm going to sell one. I've built up some equity in my property that I'm selling. I'm going to take that cash and buy two and leverage up. Sell two. Use that cash, go buy four and build wealth. Classic investing, right? Use other people's money and use the equity that you got to keep going. If somebody just sold, paid their taxes, they have less cash to use to buy, to buy more. So they don't have as much 
uh, leverage. They can't leverage as much. So that's part of the logic of this thing. All right. All right. Cool. So motivations all over the map on what, what people are doing. Let me give you a little history. The concept, the premise of an exchange has been around since the 20s. Farmers used to swap land all the time. Here, you take my acreage, I'll take your acreage, all that sort of stuff. It's normal stuff. They just swap deeds. We started taxes right about 1919, somewhere in there, and the government quickly figured out when people just swap deeds, they trade, there's no money, there's no cash. They used to swap horses, right? There's no money there. How do you even tax that transaction? So the basic premise of a trade, a swap, has been around since the 20s. And how do you even value that? Here, you take my acreage, I'll take yours. What is the value? The farmers know the value, but nobody else knows the value. So that's the basic premise. In 79, we had the Starker case, and I'm gonna to touch on him in a, in a moment, but he's the one that gave us the delay, give up the property, the relinquish, the one you're trying to get rid of, and then later get the replacement. So he's a key player in our business to give us the delay. 84 is when we got the timing to do an exchange. Mr. Starker had done his transaction over multiple years. The government didn't like transactions swinging in the wind for multiple years, so they gave us 180 days to get her done and 45 days to identify, and I'll cover that in detail. 86 is when we actually got a change uh, to capital gains, right? They're now long-term capital gains are of a different rate than normal income. 89, we got uh, related party and foreign property rules. 9091 is really when the exchange world changed because that's when the government issued the regulation on the defle de delayed exchange, deferred exchanges and they created the role of the qualified intermediary. And that's when my dad jumped into business. So they, government gave us the roadmap on how this stuff works. We didn't make it up on our own. 2000, we got guidance on doing them backwards, reverse exchanges, which I'll touch on. And then in 2002, we got guidance on tenant and common property. You don't have to be the sole owner on a property when you do an exchange. You can sell your property and go in with others on a replacement property and be co-owners and take a percentage interest in those properties. And I'll touch on that because that's a very large market space where people are joining together to buy property. Um, 2008, we got a, um, safe, a revenue procedure, safe harbor on vacation properties. Like I mentioned, I do a decent amount at the beaches. And there's always this question as, is it a second home or is it an investment property? And so the government gave us some clarity on, on that definition for in the exchange um, relationship. 2009, we got a change to the homeownership rules. There's a strategy out there to eventually move into a property, convert it to a primary residence. And then this um, uh, law changed how the math works on that. And I think I'm gonna touch on that near the very end. 2010 is when the law went into place in Virginia. As I was walking Richmond, most of the members had no idea what the heck we were talking about, but they, they did good. They, we, we got everybody on board to help us with this. The bankers, the title guys, the attorneys, CPAs, everybody was involved in do, getting this thing done. So it was a good thing. Um, we all, everybody knows we went through tax reform. So uh, with tax reform, I used to do exchanges on equipment because it was all business investment property. And that also meant personal property that was held for businesses. And now we, we don't have that anymore. So I used, I don't know if anybody's familiar with Luxstone. They're a giant um, company that build their quarries, right? They dig and um, get all the stone for all the construction jobs. They're, they're the rock guys. I used to do all their exchanges and they would have equipment that we would, they would trade in at a dealer and buy new equipment or they'd sell it at auction. And those were all exchanges. Well, tax reform, is now uh, 1031 is only real estate, okay? So if somebody says 1031, it's purely real estate. There's no more personal property exchanges. For equipment owners, um, like I mentioned, a trade-in used to be an exchange. Uh, let me give you an example. I own a bulldozer. Um, street value is 300, but my book value is zero because I've depreciated down to zero in value. In the old days, before tax reform, I would take it to the dealer and trade it in. They'd give me credit for 300, but then I'd buy another bulldozer. And so I didn't cash out. I still own a bulldozer. And that was an exchange by definition, a trade in, because I'm not cashing out of my equipment was an exchange. Nowadays, when I 
trade that thing in and they give me credit for 300, that is a taxable event. Okay, so the trade in is not a, a, uh, an exchange, it's by definition now. So I had now that's a taxable event, but if I turn around and buy another piece of equipment, I can write that equipment off immediately. I immediately expense it. So on one hand, I have a gain that shows up, and on the other hand, now I have an expense, and they'll offset each other. So this was a Republican-driven bill, and immediate expensing for businesses is very expensive in the tax code, right? Because businesses are buying airplanes and railroad cars and all that sort of stuff, and now they're writing it all off immediately. So that's very expensive. Um, and so it has a five-year clock on it, and then it begins to taper off. So through five years, a business can write it off 100%, and then it begins to taper off 80, 60, 40, that kind of stuff at through 10 years. So there's a cliff coming for all the equipment owners, and they know it's coming. Um, Avis and Hertz were all part of a coalition that we were working with, and they know this is coming. So you're gonna begin to see uh, more language about immediate expensing coming up because it's brewing in, on the hill, right? They, they know this cliff is coming. But so that's sort of a little bit of inside baseball. We know it because they've already begun. The, the equipment guys have already started making noise about it. We got to deal with this issue. This cliff is coming. Um, so what is an exchange? Just by, by definition. So allows a taxpayer exchange an investment rental business property defer the tax payment on the capital gain. Normally there's a delay. Somebody sells, turns around and buys something new. Everything passes through a qualified intermediary, somebody like me in the middle. Two people finding each other and swapping deeds is just rare. Okay, we just don't see it that often. Maybe family members swap ownership. Here's where it comes from. So this is law. It's not a scheme. It's not a program. It's just pure law. No gain or loss should be recognized in exchange of real property. So that's the word that got added with tax reform. Held for productive use in trade or business, if such property is exchanged for more real property for the same purpose. So it's real property for real property, right? That definition, the raw definition is a trade. So this was a large residential property here in the Washington DC area. That is the Hardee's in Franklin, Virginia. I don't know if anybody knows where Franklin, Virginia is. It's west of Norfolk. There's a paper plant in the town of Franklin. The whole town stinks. So, but these two guys find each other on Craigslist. They swap deeds. That is an exchange by definition. When you're trading like that, you don't need a middleman. You're just swapping deeds. We used to do the exchanges on equipment, but equipment is all gone now. We don't do those anymore. Then we had the Starker case. So Mr. Starker was in the timber business. His family is still in the timber business. He gave up some land to a timber company. Multiple years later, they replaced that land. So when he gave up ownership, they gave him a promise that they would replace what, they, what he gave them. Later, multiple years later, they gave him replacement property. He turned it into the government as an exchange and the government challenged him, said, wait a minute, that's not simultaneous. So that doesn't work. Well, he won in court. And then they challenged him a second time and he won the second time in court. When you go through the legislative history, the language, if you see down there at the very bottom of my slide, legislative history, no gain or loss if the taxpayer's money is still tied up in the same kind of property. And that was true when Mr. Starker, he had property, gave it up and he didn't get anything for it. And then later ended up with property. So he's still tied up and he didn't gain in between. That's the basic premise. So he's the one that gave us the delay. So government's got to deal with that delay. So they gave us a regulation, a deferred exchange, a delayed exchange, just like Mr. Starker had done, is defined as an exchange in which pursuant to an agreement. So Mr. Starker had an agreement with the timber company. I have exchange agreements with my client. You can almost think of me as the timber company because the government is mirroring what the Starker transaction looked like. Taxpayer transfers property that was held for productive use in trade or business, like Mr. Starker had held the property in his business, right? He had timberland. And then subsequently later receives property also to be held. So he was in the timberland business. He remained in the timberland business and kept going forward. But the sequence was give up the old, get the new. So that's what the regulation is. And this is law. 
Okay, so this is the government's interpretation of a delayed exchange. So this is law. All right, cool. Who's the middleman? So the government gave us that definition too. Who is a qualified intermediary? It's a person who is not the taxpayer or a disqualified person. So the client can't do their own deal. It can't be their own qualified intermediary or a disqualified person, which is the agent of the client. So you guys have agency with your clients. You cannot play the role of QI. Enters into a written agreement with the taxpayer, exchange agreement, and as required by the exchange agreement, acquires the relinquished property from the taxpayer. So just like the Starker transaction, the timber company took the property from Mr. Starker. Transfers the relinquished property. So when I do these exchanges, I'm stepping in to be the seller and I sell the property and take the money. That's mechanically what's happening by definition, okay? Acquires the replacement property. I'm the one with the money because it comes to escrow client picks out what they want, I will move the money to buy the property for the client, and then we'll make sure they're the owner, transfers the replacement property to the taxpayer. So they give up the property, I'm the middleman, take the money from the sale, I turn around and buy what they tell me to buy, and make sure they're the owner. So that's the basic premise. They give up ownership, get nothing, no, no gain in the middle, and end up with replacement property and keep going. So here's what I normally see. There's a contract to sell just like normal, okay? No, no rocket science in there. I need to be hired before closing. The QI is hired and assigned into that exchange agreement, into the um, sales agreement. That's how I step into the deal. I get assigned in. And my exchange agreement promises to buy something that the client tells me to buy. They're gonna identify to me what to buy, okay? We close. We deed the property directly from my client that's selling to the buyer. So it's a direct deed. I do not go on deed. And then I tuck the money in escrow. The client chooses and contracts to buy the new one. That It's normal. Go help the client get a contract to buy something. I need to get my hands on it because I'm the one with the money. I need to be part of the transaction. So I get assigned into that contract. I will create the assignment piece of paper. It's not rocket science. So I'm stepping into the client's shoes to buy the property for them, go to closing, and we deed the property directly to the client, from that seller to the client. So in the end, they gave up property, passes through me, and they end up owning property when it's all said and done. I hope that makes sense to everybody. Hey, hey Bill, can I uh, yes. ask a quick question here? Um, we apparently have a few people that are in the waiting room. Okay. Join the meeting, and since I handed it over to you, I don't have access to that. I don't okay. want to interrupt you there, but if you see I that. just clicked you... admit all. Okay, perfect. Oh, yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, that's what you get for handing off to me. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. I'm looking for it. I'm like, okay, uh, I guess it's these hosting. I don't have access anymore. So, okay, wonderful. Yeah, they look like we had about 12 people in the waiting room. So. Oh, boy. Uh, I'm sorry. That's right. No, that was, that was my fault. Um, but uh, okay, well, we're, we're good to go. And again, you have control of as far as muting and unmuting people too, if anybody has any questions. But right now, uh, everyone is muted as he's going through everything, so. Uh, Let me make sure I can see the chat room if somebody yells at me for the mm -hmm. chat piece of this puzzle here. For those who just uh, joined, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we've got Bill Harand, uh, our 1031 expert. So uh, back to you, Bill, thank you. Okay, got it. For some reason, I can't see where the see the chat part of this uh, thing. If I don't you see, see chat, start yelling at me, all right? Okay. Yeah, I don't see anything in there. I think we're okay. Are we just starting? Uh, it's it's uh, it's about tw 20 minutes into it, but uh, because I was 10 minutes with I couldn't get in, it said host will let okay. you in. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. All right, well, we're getting to the meat of it now, Dave. So yeah, okay. now we're getting to the meat. <laughs> well, what about the salad? You know, I want to say. <laughs> I know, right. <laughs> and by the way, Bill, you definitely want to mute, Dave. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was the warning. Okay. <laughs> hey, they call uh, me ten, Mr. 1031. Yeah. Oh, good. All right. Cool. Um, let's do the math. All right. Uh, well, let's run the, run the numbers. So here is my scenario. A uh, client is selling out a half a million bucks. The basis in the property is 150. That's what uh, we paid for it years ago. Taking 45,000 of depreciation and I owe 90. That's the basic numbers. What we're after is gain. What's the gain on this thing? 
So we take the contract price, right? We've got a half a million dollar buyer shows up. I use a rule of thumb of 8% to get out. 6% commission and 2% for the rest of the stuff, transfer taxes, that kind of stuff. Gets me to an adjusted number of 40, 460. Um, my original cost basis was 150. On this property, I didn't do any improvements. So I didn't add any money to it to improve the property. Less the adjusted, less the depreciation I took, because when you take your paper write-off every year for wear and tear, that lowers the basis. You're writing off your investment. So now I'm down to this 105 number after a number of years of rental. So my gain is the difference between my current adjusted basis and that 460 number, right? Because I'm adjusting for cost to get out. So that gives me, what's that gain number? 355. All right, what's the tax on the 355? So 45,000 is uh, recaptured. That's the one most people miss. So you're able to take that paper loss over all these years, but when you cash out, government wants it back. The highest rate is 25%. Most people are in the 24% bracket, so they probably are going to pay a 24%. That's 11 grand. That's the one most people miss. And then the profit, the amount it went up in value is 310. And that's at 15%. Long-term capital gains is 15%. That's 46 grand, but I have a caveat on there. See a big old paragraph, you know, a caveat. We have a progressive tax system. The more you make, the more you pay. So we're about to put 350 something thousand dollars on somebody's tax return. So they're gonna be rich for the year. You mix that in with all their other stuff, they're rich people. So the first other tax that's gonna kick in is that net investment income tax, the Medicare tax of 3.8%. That kicks in when the, the net investment income is above 200 individual, 250 married. This is gonna impact that transaction. The second piece is if you're really wealthy on an annual basis and your income climbs above 441, 500 single, 496 married, the rate changes to 20%. So you gotta be pretty, you gotta be doing pretty damn well to have the rate changed on you up to the 20%. My point is my number calculation there of 57 grand is too low, right? It should be a bigger number. I don't know if anybody's written a giant check like that, but they're painful to write, right? I use Virginia on here. I know that uh, Maryland's probably, especially Montgomery County, I think is about 7%. I think six for the state and another one for the county in there. My point is the, Probably if I put Maryland in there calculation, I'm probably looking at 90 grand going out the door. All right, just ballparkish trying to go out. So there's the business decision. I'm selling this half a million dollar townhouse. I did all the work on it, right? Three T's, toilets, tenants, trash. I know there's more T's, taxes, termites, that kind of stuff. And I got to fork over uh, 90 grand. Well, that's a lot of money. So I don't know if I want to uh, do that. I see somebody else is still waiting here. I'll admit, Mark, cool. Um, so that's part of the motivation. Those are big tax numbers. Uh, as when we were lobbying on the Hill to protect 1031 exchanges, we call that the lock-in effect. So if you eliminate 1031 exchanges on real estate, and people are selling and they realize they have a gigantic tax bill, they'll, they'll freeze. And we call that the lock-in effect. And part of the logic of an exchange is investors can move their investment property anywhere they wanna go. They're not cashing out. If they do cash out, they pay their taxes. This is really about moving, trading their property for other property. And so that's part of the churn of the economy. And so that's something the government really wants is they want that activity, right? They want the churn in the economy. And if you eliminate this and you put big number tax numbers in front of uh, clients, they won't move, they'll freeze, okay? So that was part of the logic of this thing. Okay, what can we exchange? What, what does that mean? So by definition now, it's real estate for real estate, real property for real property. It can be any kind of real estate for any other kind of real estate anywhere in the country. So I can go from dirt into a rental beach house, warehouse, mix and match, all I want anywhere in the country. 
So it's a very broad definition. The key piece is it's all business investment property. No homes, no second homes, and I'm gonna talk about it in a minute, no flipping property. That property is held for resale. It's not held for investment purposes, okay? This is also the whole bundle of rights. So I did a transaction not too long ago for a cell tower easement down in Richmond, about an acre plus a little road that ran up to it for perpetual timber rights, the right to cut forever. So it's part of the bundle of rights. I've done density rights, development rights. Um, I'm working on a transaction in DC for air rights down in Chinatown. So the lady that is selling in Chinatown or potentially selling in Chinatown, what she's selling is the air above her building because the guy with the condo behind doesn't want anybody to build and block his view. New York, that's a common thing. So it's a very broad definition of what can and cannot be exchanged. So you gotta broaden your thought process as to what this is all about. It's just not townhouse for townhouse. It's very broad definitions. What's not covered? Homes, I've mentioned that a couple of times. That's the basic rules. Hopefully everybody understands those basic rules of when you sell a home, you can exclude $250,000 if you're single, half a million dollars if you're married, every two out of five years, okay? When the tax bill was working its way up the hill on the house side, it changed to five out of eight. And we were like, oh, that's terrible. If you had to use your home five out of eight years to get your 250, half a million bucks, that would have locked up the residential market space. It's too much. The Senate bill came along, it was the same, five out of eight. Well, that's bad. When both bills match up, that's bad. Well, it went to conference and we think NAR was in the room there beating on them because it came out unchanged. It's still the same 250, half a million, which was a good decision on their part, in my opinion. Um, second home vacation homes are not exchangeable. Those are personal use properties. And like I mentioned at the beaches, there's always this question, what is it? Is it second home? Is it an investment property? Well, we do know that if you limit your personal use to 14 days or 10% of the days rented, so if somebody rents for 300 days, they could use it 30 days and they're, they're still okay as a business investment property. If you limit your personal use to those few days, you can treat that property as an investment property. Okay, when you tip over that uh, amount of usage, personal use, then you've really told the government that's a second home and it won't qualify for an exchange. So you gotta be careful. Can I ask a question? Sure. If, if you don't rent it very much, it's because you didn't try or it's not a good area and you rented it for 30 days and, you, uh, and then, uh, well, that limits, uh, I'm thinking through it here. Uh, You're okay. Yeah, so it's just 10% of. It's uh, the personal use that taints a property. Yeah. Right? There's nothing that says it actually has to rent. For example, dirt, you don't have to rent, right? It's, it's still an investment property. So it's not the rental income that drives that. We do have a safe harbor, which I'm gonna talk about near the end, where, these properties are really held for rent, but you only have to have a minimum amount of rent. It's 14 days per year to really be treated as a business investment property. Hey, Bill, we um, did have a question in the chat from uh, sure. Andy. Uh, it may have been from the prior slide. It said, how about TDRs? I don't know what that reference is. I'm not sure what a TDR is. A TDR is a transfer development right <coughs> on property. Oh, sure. You can do a development right. Okay, sure, well, I'm doing one now, so I'm hope I was hoping you were going to say that. Yeah, yeah, you can. Okay, very good, sir. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Um, but, but how do they know how much you used it? Ah, great question. So, um, the if you rent for 14 days, because that's their minimum threshold, right? And they they gave us a safe harbor, which I'm going to touch on. That causes a schedule E which is the rental form. And on the Schedule E is your personal use check boxes. That's how they know. And nobody lies on their tax return. No one lies, that's, that's right. a good thing. Okay. Right. right, so they did that on purpose, right? Because what is this property? If they tell you you gotta rent it a little bit, that causes some income, which causes the E, which has the check boxes, the personal use check boxes. So people do get around it that way. 
They just lie. There's nothing to get around. Oh, no, they don't lie on their tax return. You're not telling me that. Oh, okay. No way. Nobody does that. I told you to mute him. <laughs> well, it's, if the, I have somebody in this situation, sure. so they, if they use it all the time and if they just check out, they don't, there's just no way they could ever find out. I mean, if the government wants to find them, they'll find them. That's an easy one for the government to pick up. And there's plenty of stories about that. All the government's got to do is call the neighbor and go, oh, yeah, he's over there all the time. And you're done. Check your cell records. If they want to see it, they'll see it in a heartbeat. That's, that's easy for them. So that's, it's playing roulette with the IRS, whether you get picked up on or not. Okay. All right, cool. Um, dealer property. So dealer property is not exchangeable. What's a dealer? A builder, developer. They cannot do exchanges. They hold property for resale. And so typically that's what a flipper is too, right? They buy something, add some value to it and sell it. That's their intent going in. It's just to resell the property. So they don't fit that definition of uh, um, held for investment purposes. I've got clients that are both. They're both flippers and they're buy and hold guys. Our cheap advice is to run two businesses. I got an LLC that's my flipping business. That's just income to me. And then I got my buy and hold business that I hold my property in LLCs. And you want to keep the two away from each other because a dealer business will taint the buy and hold business if you're not careful. All right. The dealer thing gets very squishy. I, I had a CPA involved with a client. He was a dentist. He built a property. It took him two years to build the property. Well, he was a lousy flipper, right? So the CPA was okay with him treating that property as business investment, even though he never rented it. He was probably pushing the envelope, but that's, he seemed to be okay. The new one was going to be a rental property. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. So it gets a little squishy in there as to what it is it. Hard, there's not a lot of hard and fast, right? Intent is the word the government uses and that gets pretty squishy, all right? All right, uh, partnership interests are not exchangeable. So um, let me give you an example. I decided to b go in with my neighbor to buy a beach house. The attorney told us to create an LLC. I'm a member, he's a member untitled down the courthouse is an LLC. That is the tax owner. The LLC files a tax return. It's got rental income, depreciation, everything. Passes through to us individually as members on a K-1. But the tax owner is the partnership. It can do an exchange because it's the tax owner, not the members. Well, we've got clients. Let's say I'm mad at my neighbor. I don't want to go with him on the next deal. I don't like this partnership anymore. But I can't do an exchange because I own a membership interest in a company. So we go through these exercises called drop and swap and swap and drop. And they have to be planned out way in advance where we close the partnership, retitle the property tenants in common because I don't want to be in a partnership with my neighbor anymore. I don't like him. I own the property for a while. I own a 50% tenant in common interest in the property, collect my half of the rent, my half of the depreciation directly. And then we sell and I do an exchange. Is there a time limit on how, how long you have to rent that once you once you switch to in common? So that definition of you can do an exchange on property that was held for investment, that's how proof on your books. Always my my cheap answer to that is the longer the better. Um, we generally say a year right? Or at least cross tax returns so that you're showing the ownership on one tax return and the ownership on the next tax return directly. I did a transaction for some doctors that were in an LLC out of Fredericksburg. They dropped out of the partnership at 10 o'clock and they sold the building at 11 o'clock. I thought that was a little aggressive, right? Because they only owned it personally for an hour. But they had CPAs and attorneys crawling all over the transaction, right? Now, hopefully everybody's E&O insurance was paid up because if it ever goes through an audit, that, that would be an easy one for the government to penetrate. The, the gist is that you got to go through all the steps to make sure that that's valid. That's what you're doing. There are several court cases that are less than a year out there, but the clients had done all the proof that it truly was an investment property, okay? Time is a piece of that puzzle. The more time you have it owned individually, the more proof you have that it's a business investment property, okay? The shorter the time, less proof you got. 
Um, okay, and properties outside the U.S. are not like kind. So you can't take the money and go to Costa Rica because the government doesn't like it when you leave the country and don't pay your taxes. They don't, they don't like that part. Let's talk about timing for a minute. This is the hard part of an exchange. When you close on the one you're giving up, the clock starts. You have 180 days to own new property. Got to be done in 180 days. That's the way the law is written. In the first 45 days, you've got to identify. What does that mean? That is a piece of paper between the client and I. They're telling me what to buy. It's a critical piece of paper. It's a crucial threshold. I've got to have an identification at the 45th day. If I don't, I'm stopping the exchange automatically. I don't know what to do with the money if I don't have a list by the 45th day. This piece of paper, there's, there's three rules. One is called the three property rule. You can give me a list of three properties of any value. The way the government describes that is unambiguous. You gotta be clear what you want me to buy with the money. I have an address. If it's a condo, I gotta know the unit number. What am I buying? Okay. The second rule is called the 200% rule. You can, if the list is four or more, then the list value cannot exceed two times what was sold. So in the scenario I started with, we sold out at half a million bucks. That means the list, if it has four or more on it, cannot be more than $1 million, two times what was sold. So you get limited as to what can be on your list if it's four or more. The third rule is called 95% rule. I rarely see this. If the list has more than three and the value of the list exceeds two times what was sold, you have to buy 95% of the list. I had a client sell a pretty large property in Northern Virginia. He bought 15 rentals from a little old lady's estate in Richmond. Well, it was definitely more than three. It was definitely more than two times what he sold, but he bought them all. He used the 95% ID rule, so he was okay because he bought them all. It was just a package deal from the estate. Okay, so the hardest part of an exchange, no ifs, ands, or buts, is committing to a list at the 45th day, okay? I can't change the list after the 45th day. If somebody does not identify at 45 days, I don't know what to buy. I'm stopping the exchange automatically and return the cash on day 46. The client just pays their taxes. That's the moment to stop an exchange at 45 days. If they do give me a list, I've got this list after the 45th day. That's a commitment. The client is telling me to buy from the list, those are the choices, all the way through 180. My point being, the list can't change after 45 days and they can't call me on day 60 and say, hey, Bill, I hate America. I'm leaving the country. Send me my cash. I can't stop the exchange. We're in this box. So I'm either buying or I'm running out of the 180 days and, and then I stop. You can always write a contract on something new, the replacement side, anytime. This is not about contracts, it's about ownership dates. Today, the market is hot. This goes back to my planning word that I had started with. If somebody is planning, when they get a contract to sell and they're pretty comfortable, they're going to closing on the sales side, start committing contracts to purchase. You're going to that seller of the replacement property and say, hey, I'm about to close on my relinquished property. Will you take my contract and wait for me to close? The ideal world is somebody closes at 10 o'clock, they're using the same title company and they're buying at 11 o'clock and it's done. But, so the contracts are done well in advance, but the settlements are sell and then buy with the money. So where I'm, what I'm saying is to plan these things out and hustle to find something new so that you're, you don't have to deal with the 45 day. You already know what you're buying and are trying to contract for it ahead of time, okay? Uh, I got Don waiting, so let me admit Don. Cool. All right, can you get more time? So 9-11 uh, was actually the very first extension. We had a bunch more, the government typically puts in an automated process when they declare disaster, they add 120 days to both the 45 and 180. The COVID disaster, they did not do that. They put an extension to 715. So um, we are complaining up a storm with Treasury because everybody's exchange dates start at different times, but they gave us an extension to 715. So anybody that's got an exchange ticking along with me, both the 45 and the 180 are extended to the 715. So if somebody closes now, 
this extension stuff isn't going to help them because their 45 days is going to be after 715 anyway, or it's really close. Okay. We, we do have a request into Treasury to uh, help us, but the feedback we're getting is they're kind of busy and so they're not going to help us with any more relief. So I wouldn't be um, uh, optimistic about that if that's the right word to use. All right, cool. How much do I have to buy to not pay tax? So we know what the numbers are to sell. It's expensive to cash out and pay your taxes. We know what we can buy, right? So we know can buy any kind of real estate. Now, how much do I have to buy to def defer all the gain? This is a good slide. So I'm selling out half a million. It's gonna cost me 40 to get out. I got that adjusted selling price of 460. The whole premise of an exchange, the, the whole idea is you're continuing your investment. You own something worth 460. You may owe a lot of money on it, but you own an asset worth 460. You're looking to replace that 460 investment or more. So exchanging is replace that value and put all the money in. So on my slide there on the left side, you see I'm paying off the mortgage, the 90 grand. I'm left with 370 of cash. That's the cash equity coming out of the deal. That money's gotta be reinvested. So if I go buy another property worth 460 and I put the 370 back into the deal, where will the rest of the money come from? So I'm buying at 460, I got 370 to put down. Most clients go and borrow it again, go get another mortgage for 90 or you can put in your own money, doesn't matter. The premise, the idea is you gave up 460, you still own 460 worth of real estate and all the money's been reinvested. You didn't cash out anything and you keep going. These things are values. On the sales side, on the relinquished side, that could be two properties worth that much real estate. And uh, same on the buy side, that can be multiple properties to replace that value. So. When the government looks at an exchange transaction, it's just how much real estate did you give up? How much real estate do you own when you're all said and done? And did you cash out? Does that make sense? Cool. So we're gonna do an exchange. We're gonna follow the safe harbor, the way the government told us to do this stuff. You gotta have intent to do an exchange, form and documentation, paperwork is important, control the money by the middleman, like kind properties and time limits. So here's that definition of a QI. And I touched on this briefly, but the disqualified person cannot be the agent of the client because the agent is the client. So you guys are in the middle of that process, right? You've got agency, so you can't play the role of QI, family, investment broker, CPA, they all have agency. What I bump into is the attorneys. So around here, the attorneys represent the transactions. The settlement companies represent the transactions. They're not necessarily representing the parties. So they can also play QI. But if an attorney had done other work for the client, right, created agency, then they are disqualified. So the technical answer of who can be a QI is more that who cannot be a QI. So you could have your neighbor Bob be the QI if you wanted to. You just better hope Bob knows what he's doing. So it's not who can be a QI, it's who cannot be a QI. That's the definition. Let's talk about paperwork for a second. This is a normal sales and settlement process. This is not rocket science. You're gonna go get a contract to sell, just like normal. Me as the QI, I have to be hired before closing. That is a phone call that I hate. It's Monday morning, phone call comes in. Hey, I wanna do an exchange. Okay, what's going on? I sold last Friday. I cannot help you exchange something you do not own. Oh no, it's just paperwork, fix it. No, it doesn't work that way. We can't go backwards in time and undo a sale. It doesn't work that way, okay? That's called tax fraud, that's a bad thing. So that's a critical piece. I'm reemphasizing that now a couple of times. You've gotta have the QI hired before closing. Remember by definition, it's my job to do the transfer. That's what my role is transfer wise, okay? So get a contract to sell, I get hired, I'm using DocuSign like you guys are, so everything happens very quickly. I'm assigned into the contract. As part of the regulation, I must notify everybody of the assignment. I do that through closing. And I have a set of settlement instructions for the settlement company. Hey, this is an exchange, I was hired, I was assigned into the contract. Please send me the money and please deed the property from my client to the new buyer and we're done. 
clock co money comes to escrow, clock starts, off we go. I'm going to deal with the client on the 45-day ID. That's my role, to be the middleman. Your job is go help them find a new property. Go get a contract, just like normal. Get that contract. I got to get my hands on it so I know what we're buying. I'm checking the list. I'm going to create an assignment, single piece of paper. This is not rocket science. I'm stepping into their shoes. I have the money. I'm going to send settlement instructions to that closing company. Hey, I was assigned in as the buyer. Here's the money. The client is bringing the rest of the money. Please close this transaction and deed the property directly to my client. And we're done. So they give up property. They get nothing in the middle. And they own property when we're all said and done. The property they picked out. Okay? Cool. All right. This is the slide I don't want you to listen to me on. Right? So you need to follow your broker on this thing. Don't listen to me. I'm normally in class, I'm asking questions. I, I make everybody squirm in their seat. And I get to ask questions. So everybody's got to squirm while I'm watching on the, on the video here. Yeah, there you go. All right, so do you need to have it in the listing? So uh, my answer is no. I don't think you need to have a 1031 exchange comment in the listing. You know, somebody says, hey, I'm selling my rental house, townhouse, I'm gonna do an exchange. You as agents, my cheap advice is, I don't think you need it in the listing. I think you're just going to scare off a buyer, right? Or some other agent that has no idea what you're talking about. I think you're just going to scare them off. So I don't think it's necessary. What about in the contract? You have to have language in the contract. Well, from a, uh, in our area here, you got to remember the, what's going on. So the contract gets signed and it's assigned to the QI, somebody like me. Your generic GCAR contract, NVAR, the, most of them have a restriction on assignment. That's what I'm after, is to let me assign myself into that contract. My assignment is a limited assignment. I'm only being assigned into the right to the contract, not the obligation. So it's a limited assignment so that I can step into the transaction, okay? So I have addendums you can use, right? They're on my website. I can email them to anybody if you want them. GCAR's got an addendum you can use. So you can add these to these contracts to permit the assignment. Okay, where's the issues? I had a client sell a large property out of Manassas. It was very large. He was trying to buy a hotel. And he went to the hotel seller, told him he's in the middle of an exchange, and the hotel seller wisely said, oh, sure, I'll sell you the hotel, raised the price by half a million bucks. So why would the hotel seller do that? Well, hotel seller knows this guy's got a clock ticking and he's got profit to shelter, maybe he'll pay more. So he was trying to take advantage of it because he knew there was an exchange involved. So my messaging in here is be very, very careful with these things. 98% of the time, nobody knows what you're doing. Ah, it's an exchange, they're good buyers, no worries. It'll be the 2% that you remember, right? Because somebody tried to take advantage of it. So be careful in here. North Carolina has already changed their contracts. So in the body of their North Carolina sales contract, it says the contract may not be assigned unless it's a 1031 exchange. So at some point I gotta get on my horse here and get it fixed for you guys. So I gotta get the NBA R one done and the GCAR one done. So at some point we'll fix it, but that's the issue. Be, just be careful with it, okay? I'm a little close to it, so maybe I'm sensitive to it, but be careful. And you follow your broker on this slide. Don't listen to me, right? Whatever your broker tells you, that's what you do. All right, titling. So this is about taxes, right? So the ta same tax owner that sells, it's gotta be the same tax owner that buys. Bill Horan sells, Bill Horan's gotta be the owner on the buy side. Bill Horan, Kathy, my wife, we both made money. We both gotta own replacement property. We're continuing our investment. Couple of exceptions, single member, single owner LLC, Bill Horan sells, Bill Horan can be the, um, Bill Horan LLC can be the buyer, as long as Bill's the sole member, because single member LLCs are disregarded. So it's okay to change the titling on the buy side as, as long as it's the same taxpayer. Same with a revocable trust, Bill Horan trustee can be the buyer of Bill's revocable trust, because revocable trusts don't file tax returns. Same with a Delaware statutory trust. You can buy into a beneficial interest or tr into a trust. You're not actually on title, but you own an interest in a trust, and that is okay in an exchange. The government has green-lighted that transaction. All right. What's what's my timing here? I'm 11.58. Yeah. You're okay. We'll probably run over about 15 minutes, but uh, if it's okay with At you. At the max. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, whatever. All right. Let's do it backwards. So I covered a bunch, right? I, I covered what is an exchange? Where does it come from? What kind of property can we buy? The steps in there, the math. Let's do it backwards. So basic exchanging, sell, buy, go through a QI, buy something new. A couple of rules. You cannot exchange into something you already own. So you can't already own the replacement property. You can't sell something and buy from yourself. That does not work. And improvements on property you already own are not like kind. I don't know if everybody remembers back to principles, but we have real property and we have personal property, two different things. Exchanging is real property for real property. So if we sell something, real property, the money's gotta be used to buy real property. So if we buy something new, we can't hold back some of the cash and then buy some shingles to be added to your own property. That's personal property. So that cash from the sale of real estate can't be used to buy what we call sticks and bricks. That's not real property. And you're adding it to your own property. It's not real property, okay? So what happens if somebody wants to buy something ahead of time? The market's hot. I'm doing a decent amount of these reverse exchanges. The client wants to lock up that new property. They don't want to lose it. So the government gave us a, a, a revenue procedure on doing it backwards. And I'm going to walk you through a couple scenarios so you see what we're doing. We introduce what's called an EAT, an exchange accommodation title holder. It's a third party, a straw man to force the scenario of a sale and then a purchase. Okay. So here's where it comes from. Government told us how to do it. Let me give you a couple scenarios. There's the replacement property. That's the deal of the century. If I don't take ownership to that replacement property, I'm gonna lose it. I got competition to buy it. I haven't sold my relinquished property yet. It's still, it's on the market, but I haven't sold it. What am I gonna do? I'm gonna engage in EAT, exchange accommodation title holder, for it to buy the new property for me exchange accommodation title holder and hold the title. We sell the relinquished property and buy from the EAT that's waiting for me. So we're putting a third party, a straw man, whatever you want to call it, to hold the ownership of the replacement until we're ready to sell. Because the law is sell and then buy. So the government says we can put these temporary owners in place. There's issues here, right? These are not simple transactions. Where's the money coming from to buy ahead of time? Clients got to come up with the money. I've got clients that have cash, so they'll loan the money to the holding company to buy, and we give them an IOU and everything. They sell the relinquished, buy from the holding company that's waiting for them, and we pay the client back. So we got to come up with money. Settlements, how many closings are in these transactions? The uh, Eat buys, right, that's a closing from the, the seller, that's a settlement. There's cost there. We sell the relinquished, that's another cost. And then we're buying from the holding company. So we're adding another transaction in there. Depending on what state we're in, we're typically using LLCs to buy the replacement property. And what we typically do is we actually transfer the LLC to the client. So they become the sole member of the LLC that's on title. And that's not a normal settlement, if you will. That's the sale of the company that owns the real estate. And that's okay in the exchange world. So it depends on what state we're in and whether we can use that strategy to avoid another transfer tax, then we structure these things to try and take advantage of those things, okay? So that's what I'm saying. These are not easy because the government says, sure, you can do this if you put a temporary owner in place. Well, it comes with all the issues with putting a temporary owner in place. You got to figure that part out. Okay. We know how to do it. It's just not as easy as it looks. Okay. The exchange language says you got to sell and then buy. So in this scenario, I could actually take the old property. So I'm strategizing with clients when we get on the phone, what properties are you selling? Where's the money coming from to try and buy something ahead of time? And what states are we in? How, what are we dealing with with transfer taxes? Okay. So those are the kinds of things that I strategize with clients to figure these things out. Let me tell you what an improvement exchange is. Remember I mentioned that you can't 
take money from the sale of the real estate and then buy shingles and put it on a property you already own. Those are, those are personal property, right? So what do we do? Let me give you an example. I'm gonna sell something worth 460, right? It's a rental townhouse. And I found a new beach house for 400 grand. It's a wonderful beach house. That's the deal of the century, but it needs a pool. And if I sell at 460 and I buy down to 400 in value, I just expose 60 of my gain to taxes. And I don't really wanna do that because I also still want a pool. So we have a holding company buy the new one for us and add the pool while it's being held. So we can improve the property while the holding company owns it, getting it up to 460 in value, and then we sell it to the client. So they go from 460 to this newly improved property that's got the pool in it, and we don't pay any taxes. I did a transaction for a dentist out of uh, Reston, Virginia. A developer came in and took the whole complex. So everybody in the condo complex was selling out. We took all the money from his sale. He bought a rental condo in Chantilly, Virginia. And we took the rest of the money and we bought an office suite in Herndon, Virginia, and we built it out for him. I say, we built it out for him. He's doing all the work, he's driving everything. We held title to the Herndon property while it was being improved. So we got all the improvements added to his new office and then we sold it to him. So all the money from his sale, which was a lot of money because this developer really wanted that property, was used to buy two properties and one of them we added value to to get all the money used and improved. If he had just sold and, and cashed out and paid his taxes, he would not have had as much money to buy the Chantilly property and improve his, his new office. So, so it was a, the QI can also be the holding company? We, we create separate holding companies. It could. I don't know of any of my counterparts that actually use their QI company to do that. We have a separate reverse holding company to do that. We can be the same players, though. We can play both roles. Yeah, you're allowed to put the players. That's a question. All right, cool. All right, let me let me get. I'll be. I'll finish up here for you guys. Um, it is okay, and I touched on it. It's okay for you to go in with others to buy property. So you can either buy it as tenants in common, right? Everybody's name is down at the courthouse, and everybody owns a certain percentage. Or nowadays, what we're primarily seeing is what's called Delaware statutory trusts. So we we know. Um, Oh, I don't have my slides up there for my pictures. Um, there's a gigantic market space. Uh, it's a billion dollars out there that um, these companies that are called sponsors, they're real estate companies. They're buying commercial property. They're holding it as a Delaware statutory trust, and then they're selling beneficial interest in that trust. So for example, uh, the BJ's here in Gainesville, Virginia with me is a Delaware statutory trust. So individuals like you and I have sold something, investment property, and they're buying an interest in the BJ's. So that is a replacement property and it's okay with the IRS. The population's getting older. All the old people own all the real estate. They've got all the gain and all the potential taxes, but they're tired. They don't wanna be the landlord anymore. So they're searching for something to invest in to not pay tax, still pay them some money, right? Cash flow and not do any of the maintenance. So this entire DST market space has built up to take all that 1031 exchange money. And it's all kinds of properties are sold that way. Apartment buildings, the, the triple net properties, the Burger Kings, the CVSs, the Home Depots, they're on fire. Uh, I think they're breeding dollar general stores just in general, they're all over the place. And a lot of that is exchange money because this money is chasing those, those properties, okay? And then the client, they call it mailbox money, you know, lawn chair money, whatever you want to call it. They don't have any work to do. The management company takes care of it. You're paying a premium for somebody else to babysit your property. You can't be naive about it, right? Because somebody else is running the thing. But it is a, is a market out there where I've got a good bit of my clients that are buying into that space. I'd say a good 10 to 15% of my clients are buying their into with somebody else. I've got clients that want to downsize, so they're selling something that's large, 
they're going to buy something smaller as an investment property, and then they'll fill up with a DST. The second replacement property is DST property to fill up their value that they're trying to replace. All right, hopefully that makes sense. All right, I'm at 12.08. I know I went a little long. Um, I'm going to skip through this stuff here. Does anybody have any questions? I'm going to unmute everybody. How about this? We, have, we have one question in the uh, chat from okay. Jacqueline asking, um, uh, how about if you only rent a couple of rooms in a second home? Is this considered an investment property or a second home? Um, so that's what we call a mixed use property. It's hard when it's just a couple of rooms to differentiate between what it is. If, if you live there and you rent out a couple of rooms, the primary residence exclusion is gonna cover most of your gain anyway. Um, if it's a second home and you're renting out a couple of rooms, you, you have to carve out those, those spaces, if that's the right word to use, and that's the investment portion, and the rest of it is second home. Okay. They get very, um, it's hard with those because who's using the bathroom, who's sharing the kitchen, those things get really complicated. It's, it's very similar logic as you got an office, home office, you're treating the home office on your books as investment part, portion, right? Normally what I see is there's a hard D mark, like I own a three-story townhouse and I rent the basement, there's a floor between them. That's a very clear demarcation point. That portion of the property is investment. Um, but that's, that's common. So think of the farmer, he owns one property. He's got his little farmhouse that he lives in, right? With the one acre and the little white picket fence, that's his home. And the rest of it is his working farm. And that's the investment portion. And you, so you can have one property and have both things on it, but you gotta be careful with your books. I, hopefully I've answered your question. Sure. Hey, Bill, I had a quick, uh, I guess a clarification. Um, where can you use your services? Meaning uh, we've got one right now where the seller has decided they do want to do an exchange right. a property and they want to purchase a property on the West Coast uh, for business use for their you know, kids' business. Can you help them with something like that? Oh, yeah. This is federal. So I do exchanges all over the country. Everybody's moving their stuff everywhere. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. As, uh, the 180 days is to get, enter a contract or go to settlement? Own the property. So from giving up ownership to owning new is 180. And, and let's say stuff happens like COVID or, you know, they got delayed for whatever reason and it goes beyond that time, it's too bad? Um, well, COVID, we got an extension. So, but, but let's just use the example, saying, right? 180, that, that, you know, that's the definition of a taxpayer because they're paying taxes. They didn't if it, if you just follow can't the rules. Settlement, maybe the uh, attorney got sick or whatever, you know, there's a million, a million delays. Then it goes past 180, the deal's done? Yeah, you get a that's tax the bill. definition of a taxpayer. The government doesn't care what the issues are. The law is 180 days to move your investment. And that's where I'm going back to that planning word. You gotta do this stuff up front early before you come in on these deadlines. Yeah, I mean, let's just say the person that's selling to you doesn't show up. <laughs> he, he took a vacation, you didn't even know it, tough luck. That's the, that's the definition of a taxpayer. There are no exceptions to that. Could I sell my investment property and buy into my spouse's property? Oh, that's, I didn't, I don't think I had that slide up there. You can't buy from related parties, meaning okay. your direct bloodline, uh, mom and dad, brothers and sisters, kids, or your spouse. In-laws are okay. Uncles are okay, cousins, they're all okay. What the government is looking for is what's called a basis shift among family. And, and so that's a no-no transaction. When you complete an exchange and you fill out this form, IRS form 8824, right on the front page it asks, is this a related party transaction? Okay, Answer thank you. No. There's, a, there's a very narrow exception to that, but most people don't meet that exception. You could do it with your living girlfriend. Say case, that again. You in the you case know. you had a lot in girlfriend. In the case you had a lot, a vacant lot, and you never built on it. Uh, right. 
consider possibly building a residence, but you gave that up a long time ago. Can you use that vacant lot, which has not uh, had any uh, consideration on the taxes as a business property, can you uh, have that as a part of an exchange? Yes, absolutely. That's an investment. That's investment property. Yeah, dirt is an investment property. And then back to the question that you could do it with, let's say, your girlfriend or you know, like it's it's not a marriage, but correct. It's obvious, you know, it's an obvious, you know, basis. Correct. You yeah, that's it. OK. It's just mom and dad, brothers and sisters, kid, direct bloodline or spouses. Hi, Bill. I have a question. Um, sure. Um, so in real estate investment, is the tax different between uh, holding the investment property within a year and more than a year? Are they going to be like a short-term uh, capital gain and long-term cap capital gain as well? Or no? Yeah, you get to long-term capital gains after one year of ownership. And if it's less than that, it's just income. You just It's an investment money, but it, you just pay at your income tax rates. Okay, so you are, if you are holding more than a year, that you consider as a long-term capital investment, gain. right? Right. Cap long-term capital gain, yes. That's right. Just like the a same stock. same as the yep. stock That's market. Right. Right? It is, it's like the same. stock market, right? Yep, same stuff. Hey, Bill, yeah, just to kind okay. of clarify Nick's question, we do have that come up where people are, agents are working with investors who are flipping properties. Yep. Usually they'll say, can we do a 1031? And um, you know, I usually advise them, obviously, be mindful of these timelines are good, and, and a lot of those situations just don't make sense. So if you could maybe chat about that. Yeah, great question. Always default to the tax person, right? Hopefully they're, they're, Flipper's got a tax person that's helping with this stuff. Just on the surface, if their business is flipping, they're really a dealer. That's their intent from going in. They're buying and selling. They're not intending to hold the property as a business investment property. Most of the flippers that I know, they sell high and they want to buy low. And if you remember from my slides, you, you, I'm selling it, you know, 460. I got to buy at 460 again to not pay tax. And most of the flippers I know don't want to do that. They want to go buy cheap again. Right? God bless them. Mm -hmm. But it just doesn't fit the definition of an exchange. Well, you could buy a, a cheap, more expensive property. Oh, yeah. Maybe a cheap, lesser dollars is maybe what I should be saying. Or let's say they want to buy two lesser value properties, but they're still replacing that 460 value that I used in my example. Um, the, the point is, do they even qualify? And I'm not the decider on that stuff, right? I don't do taxes, but just from a definition, what is your business? What business are you in? Hey, Bill. Yeah. Can you expand on exchanging into a DST sure. and whether this has been a positive or negative experience for your clients? Yeah, good question. So it's a growing market, um, you know, because the economy's doing been doing good for the last what 10 ish years right so the real estate has been really doing good and so that and more and more sponsors have brought property to the market space and so i've got more and more clients that this is a, i mean it's a wonderful sales appeal no ifs ands or buts about it because hey you don't have to do anything you own commercial property somebody else is doing it all that sort of stuff i think we're going to begin to get our first testing in this real estate space as to how these properties perform I mean, if you own a building with a J.C. Penney in it, you got a problem, right? They may not be there, not going to pay. So it's real estate. You got to go in with your eyeballs wide open on what this is. I, I got involved in a transaction that was a Gander Mountain. Well, Gander Mountain went belly up, and at the time, everybody bought the building. They were a great company, but they got in trouble. So we're going to begin to see the first um, downturn, if that's the right word to use, on some of these values on these properties. Who knows what this landscape is going to look like. <clears throat> Overall, most of my clients have been very happy with it. And usually most of these DST things have a, a business life of between five and 10 years. And so they're going to, the sponsor's going to sell the building in that window and do it again. They're looking for the sweet spot on these properties. You know, what, what's the value of the lease to the tenant? 
versus what the you know the future value is on the property those cash flows what happens after the five or ten years when they sell well then the client can make a decision do they want to do another exchange or just cash out and most sponsors the the bigger ones that are in the business they have another building or choices to go into because they're in the business of selling these dst interests i've had some clients that don't like it anymore because they don't like the fee loads or whatever and they'll go back into their own real estate are the profits reported yearly on a K-1? No, because it's not a partnership. You put your interest on your Schedule E. And so they usually send out a statement of some sort that is just your breakdown of the percentage. So you put your actual rental income, depreciation, all that on your Schedule E. Okay, thank you. Hi, Bill. I think I, uh, I missed a little bit you know, at the beginning. So can you uh, uh, tell me again? So let's say your example was you bought uh, the property and you sold for 460, right? And then you buy right. back uh, at 400. So the $60,000 uh, uh, left over that, you are going to pay uh, tax on that one, right? Right. So that, that's what exchanging is, is staying fully invested. And, you know, in my scenario, I use the example of 460 is what they gave up, right? I adjusted for selling costs. And so to not pay tax, they got to buy again at 460 or more, right? Buy a more expensive investment more. and put all the money back in. When you don't do that, you start buying less of value. Your money is leaving that transaction. It's going somewhere. So you're cashing out in some fashion or form, mm -hmm. you're gonna end up paying tax on that difference. Because the first dollars that come out of an investment are the profit dollars, those gain dollars coming out. The government wants their cut. I don't know if I'm answering your question mm -hmm. or not. I do like the improvement exchange. If you happen to have like a one page <laughs> synopsis on that with your contact information in it, I think that'd be, uh, that'd be useful. Yeah, I can have all of that. Okay. Just Nick, that that kind of bridges the difference a little bit too. Yeah, you know, it's got to be. Let me let me let me talk about fees for a minute. Um, I charge seven hundred fifty dollars to exchange one property for another. So if it's just a straight swap of one real piece of real estate for another, it's seven fifty. If somebody wants to add more settlements to the process, like they sell one and buy two, I'm going to add another three hundred bucks because I'm going to go through another closing with the client. So if they do an exchange of sell one and buy two, it's 750 plus 300, pretty straightforward. If it's a reverse or an improvement exchange, I'm starting at $5,800. So if somebody wants me to hold title to property, it comes with issues. Um, there's risk there, right? I, my paperwork tries to cover that risk, but you guys know what paperwork is worth, right? So, it, and it's a more sophisticated transaction. So it's really gotta be feasible to do that. Right. I, I talked to a client yesterday. He's selling a very small condo in Texas and he wants to buy a lot, uh, I think down at Lake Anna, but it's only like 20 grand. Well, if I add a 5,800 and build, he wanted to build a rental on this lot down at Lake Anna. Well, if I add $5,800 cost to that transaction, I'm not helping him any. That's too much. Right? So it's really got to be feasible to do it backwards uh, by adding that layer of cost to it. I think, I think we did one with a parking lot or something. Yeah, it could be. I mean, I, I, I did a transaction for some tow truck drivers out of Fredericksburg, Virginia. It was about a million one worth of lot sale they gave up. And then we took that cash and bought a lot on the north side of Fredericksburg. And they put up a car wash while we were holding it. Well, that's a, I mean, that was perfect. Mm -hmm. They went from dirt, not making any money into a new business in 180 days. It was a, they had planned it all out. They knew exactly what they were doing. Well, if we have any other questions, otherwise, um, Bill, we really appreciate your time. This was you're welcome, uh, and I'm happy to help. Um, if you have questions, shoot me emails. You know, a whole crew here is pretty well trained up. We're happy to help with answer questions. What I find is once clients know where the bumpers are, what the basic rules are, they know how to maneuver from there, mm -hmm. right? and then I can backstop them answering any questions. But I, I can't emphasize enough: get the CPA first because they do the math, and then. Um, uh, got to, I got to be on board before closing. Bill, what's your contact info? 
Uh, is that on? Do I have still have my screen up there? You do. Yes. All right. I'll do. I'll go to my screen. There. Sorry, I should have stopped with that one. Well, it's Anthony Correo <laughs> signing off. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. informative. I have a few coming up. I'm doing two right now. That one with the transfer development rights. I'll be okay. Interested to share with you when we speak. You all have a wonderful day. Mike, thank you so no much. Problem. This was wonderful. Thanks for joining us. And everybody have a great day. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.